lay myself on the altar as the poster child for the girl who did everything wrong. Everything wrong. I had a a award winning, you know, championship sociopath, narcissist, sociopath in in the ring with me, and I was no match for him. No, 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 no. Um, I was completely, completely caught, like, sideswiped by this whole thing. We, um, were married young, 24, he was 26 or 27, and I was 24. Big dramatic change happened when we had kids. That was the first thing. Because then he knew I was in, you know, he knew I was in, I wasn't going anywhere. Um, but the really big change happened when we became successful in business and we started making money and he started um, he started identifying more with being a businessman than he did being uh, my husband because he, he the whole image of being a husband and father being like a, a, a respectable uh, man was very intriguing to him and that's what attracted him to me because I had this traditional kind of family. It was an old family in town, and um, you know, he, we represented something that his family was not like, and and so um, that's what he got from you know association with me in his mind. So, um, but now he was six. His you know. We were successful entrepreneurs, but my I was I, we were equal partners, uh, and we had and we had other two partners also, and but he he didn't care he was he he thought of it all as his own of course, and um, and so as soon as we started making money, it's funny the 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 better things got for us the more we realized our dream the worse. He was, the worst he treated me. So, you know, we worked our way up from just nothing, dirt poor, you know, on our way up, on our way up. Um, and so finally it, you know, the end of it was, it had been 10 years. We had a beautiful dream home we were building. We had two gorgeous children. Um, I have I have this video of, of a birthday party that I had when I was turning, um, I think, 32. And I have a, you know, my backyard's just full of friends and family, and um, you know, you look at that and you think, she's safe. That you know, how could that person ever end up destitute or alone? But I did. About the second year that we were in business, he just became impossible to li to live with. He was just rude to me all the time, mean to the kids, wouldn't come home, never slept in our bed. And I was just getting more and more depressed. And for whatever reason, I didn't associate the way he was treating me with the depression. Um, because I would go to my psychiatrist and I would say to hit her, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just, my life is perfect. And, um, but I'm just so sad. I'm so sad all the time. And I, you know. And so I was taking, you know, all these antidepressants and one day I was, I have this on another video, um, I have my heart attack story, um, but I had a heart attack at 33, at 33 years old I had a heart attack. It wasn't a blockage, it wasn't a traditional heart attack, it was actually a dissection which is um, a very rare thing that happens and it's associated with fluctuating estrogen levels and like at times of birth and that kind of thing. Uh, but that's what it was associated to. But I, 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 don't, I just know it was associated to heartache. It was, it was, my heart was breaking, literally. <laughs> so I had this, I had a near death experience um, because I had, that led to another complication, which was a femoral bleed, and I hemorrhaged, and that's when I died on the table. I was resuscitated, but I got injured when I was getting resuscitated, and my nerves and my hips and my back. And so I was in tons of pain when I left the hospital. Now, here's another thing that was interesting about it. 
I um, and this I guess will just feed into my heart attack story, but um, my uh, I had only been to the hospital three times. This was the third time. The first two times were with my kids when I had my kids, and those two times I was only in the hospital like overnight practically. And um, this time I was not in the hospital very long, but I was there for a few days. But I got no visitors. No flowers, no cards, no phone calls, nothing. Whereas in, when I had the kids, the room was full of flowers and cards and phone calls and visitors. And um, so, but I didn't, I just, I was in such a, a fog, such a, I was, I was so shut down at this point and feeling like I was, in, I just wasn't entitled to anything anymore. I don't know. It was just. I don't know. I, I I felt like I I felt like I was being blamed for it, and I blamed myself for it. <laughs> Strangely enough, um, I I blamed myself for it because I thought I willed it to happen. I because I was I was suicidally depressed, but I wouldn't have committed suicide because I wouldn't have wanted to traumatize my kids. So I believed that I willed it to happen. And when it did start to happen, I thought, thank God. Thank God I don't have to keep doing this anymore. That was my first thought. There were only these visitors there. There was my husband, my parents, my grandparents, who just happened to be volunteering in the hospital that day when they saw me on the census and then came to see me, and my father-in-law. So my father-in-law was the only one that got a phone call. Um, I mean, other than my husband called my parents um, and, I, and I tell you in the other video how that how what how I got to the hospital and all that because it's very very creepy but um, that's in the heart attack story when I came out of that you know being resuscitated and stuff my grandparents were the first ones to come in and they were tear tearing and, you know crying and oh my god we thought we were gonna lose you they called code blue twice and oh, they came rushing in here and blah 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 and, you know, that seemed like a very appropriate reaction. You know, she gave me a big hug and a kiss and all that stuff. My father-in-law walked in. He was all, like, looked like he saw a ghost. He just, was like, gave me a kiss and a hug and sat down. My husband and my parents walked in, didn't look at me, didn't hug me, didn't tell me they loved me, didn't, nothing, and stood over in the corner talking to themselves. This is where almost just died. So, <laughs> it was just unreal. But that's all the visitors, visitors I got. And I got discharged from the hospital on Easter Sunday. And on Monday, I was just alone with the kids. Like nothing happened. It was just crazy. So anyway, my, uh, and that was the beginning of the end. That was the beginning of the end for sure. And the beginning of the end started sooner than that. But this is really, it's going to be on now. Because he can't tolerate my having needs. So the reason that our marriage lasted 10 years was because that was how long it took for me to have needs. For him to, for him to perceive that I needed him more than he needed me. Now he was a successful businessman. He had the reputation he wanted. He was in, in the crowds he wanted to get into. He had admission into those crowds. He had... He, he, he had everything that he thought he was going to get through being with me. And now I needed something back, and that wasn't part of the deal for him. So it was time to get out <laughs> in his mind. And knowing my parents, and I, and I don't know how this worked. I don't know if they understood each other when they first met, but they fell in love with each other the very first minute that they met. And I thought that it had all this to do with loving me. Both of them loved me and how great that was. But I, it didn't obviously have anything to do with me. I don't know if they identified each other or if he just, I mean, he definitely um, flattered them and they were very vulnerable because they were narcissists. So he flattered them um, and that's why they loved him. Uh, so I'm not sure if they saw that he was a narcissist too. I don't know. But I didn't know what it was. I didn't see any of it. And nobody ever warned me. My parents didn't warn me, you know, he might be a narcissist. No, nobody did that, anything like that. And, and my parents obviously are unaware of their own narcissism. Yeah, because they're typical narcissists. Very, you know, very dyed in the wool narcissists. They think they're perfect. They think they're better than perfect. So, no. He knew how he could get my parents 
to turn on me. And what he did was he told them that I was depressed because I was saying that I remembered things from my childhood. And I was flashing back to things from my childhood. Well, the, he knew, knowing my parents as well as he did, he knew that that was going to be a huge trigger for them because they are very concerned with what other people think, very concerned with their family secrets. You know, it was always family secrets above everything. Family secrets, you know, don't air the family's dirty laundry and all that stuff. But I'll tell you what, when it came to the smear campaign for me, they were willing to tell everybody everything and not even everything that was true. They were willing to make up stuff, make me look bad to people. It was unreal. You know, here I've been protecting them all my life and now they're smearing me. And I, I still don't know to this day what they could have said to some of these people because I had like lifelong friends. So my husband was telling people that, that I was on drugs and he was not telling people what caused the heart attack. So it looked, you know, he was, he was, he was making it look like it was a drug related event. And then um, now that I had to take painkillers and I was on antidepressants, um, he was making it look like I was abusing prescriptions. So fast forward. So he, uh, okay, but so, so it goes on for like a year. And then I decide I really need to get off the pain medicine. And I, um, I've been taking it for a year every day and I, you know, I'm addicted to it. So I have to go to a detox. Oh my gosh, this was a bad idea. Really bad idea. I should have just waited till the divorce was over. It was just a terrible idea. Um, and also, here was what I was doing. They were jumping on me, accusing me of stuff. And I, this is what I thought. I thought, well, may, they must really be concerned about me. And I know I'm fine, but to put their minds at ease, I'll go do this, and then we can just put it behind us. That's what I thought. No. When I went, he cleared me out, cleared out our bank accounts. He locked me out of our house. He locked me out of our office. He just he just went to town doing stuff forging my signature on things i mean just crazy and when i came back everyone was still pissed off at me i mean it, no one was satisfied no one was anything they were just still just as mad it, it didn't earn me anything except for a bunch of losses and my lawyer then fired me and i because i didn't have any money to pay him and i think if i if you'd done your job i would have I would have had money to pay you. So it was just, it just went from bad to worse. And we're in counseling this whole time, him and I. Him and I. So we get together every Wednesday night and go to this counselor that he picked out. He, he uh, interviewed the guy and he got him all up to speed on, you know, what was wrong with me before he took me there. I, I think we're there for marriage counseling. And every week we go and he's very um, unguarded in these sessions. And I'm sure it's because he believes that I'm the only one being scrutinized. And so, and I, I'm totally into that too. I'm thinking that I'm the one, I'm the designated patient. I'm the one that's at fault. I'm the one that we got to fix me. And so we go every week until one day, this one appointment, the, um, the therapist says, well, I've drawn my conclusions. I've written you up a report and uh, here, here's what it is. And he goes, he had his, like, he, 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 you know, crosses his legs and he's like, You are a sociopath, he says to my husband. And then he pivots his chair and he goes, and you have a death wish, he says to me. And what do I do? What do I do? I take the report, I put it in my purse without looking at it, and I go out for nachos with my sociopathic husband. Yeah. And not only that, but to make him feel better, I tell him about something that I had done uh, that that um, made me vulnerable. But I told him about that. And I was like, you know, I did this thing. And just to make him feel better. Like, you're not a sociopath. You know, look at this thing I did. And so, you know, to tell him that I, basically to show him that I still trusted him. Because at this point, he's still playing me that we're still going to work it out. We have, he hasn't filed for divorce yet. Uh, but it's it's coming. I mean, it's like just a week away or something at this point. 
one day I'm at the dentist's office with my kids and uh, they call my son's name and this person in the waiting room goes, oh, so you're um, so-and-so, you're so-and-so's wife. And I go, yeah. She goes, oh, um, gosh, I saw your house. It's just beautiful. Oh, my gosh. I, you know, I'd love to buy it, but I don't think we can afford it. Da, da, da. It was just gorgeous. We went, we went into our tour of it yesterday. I'm like, what? Oh, yeah. It's in Homes and, it's in a Homes and Land magazine right now. I'm like, what? She pulls out Homes and Land magazine. Right on the inside cover is my house. He's signed a listing agreement. He has it for sale. I never signed a listing agreement. He's forged my signature. And not only that, he had to forge my signature on loans to finish it. So, you know, crazy. So I kind of get in a, a panic here. I go in the bathroom. I like put water in my face. And I draw, gather up the kids and I race out to, um, out to the house, realize that I'm locked out, race over to our office, realize I'm locked out, but I get someone to let me in. I go in there, I find all these forged checks, all this forged stuff, and I take it all. And I take it back to my apartment. And, um, and so the, that night I'm there I don't know where the kids were. Maybe it was after the kids were in bed. I don't remember. Oh, no, they were at school. It was the next day. The kids were at school. And I had, so after I got them off to school, I, I laid all this stuff out on the living room carpet. And I was just looking at it, trying to make sense of what I was going to do with all this. And I think I'm between lawyers a little bit right now, too, because I, I don't remember telling a lawyer about it quite yet. Oh, man, I just wish I'd taken a picture. Ugh. Anyways, he comes barging in. Now, we have a court order, he, which he put in place, a restraining order. He put in place, in place a restraining order, so, but it's a mutual restraining order, so he has to stay away from me also. He comes barging into my house, into my a little crappy apartment, which I'm in now, and, um, and threatens me, you know, tells me, you know, he sees what I, all I see, I, you know, I see it all there, and he knows the jig is up, and um, the police come, and he gets tased, and taken off and, and actually he comes there a couple of different a few different times and the police come a few different times we eventually get evicted from this apartment which he was never living there which he was supposed to be we got it for both of us his name was on the lease uh anyways okay but the next morning I got the kids off to school and I was just back home and knock 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 it's the police there to arrest me for that prescription that I had altered. And I think it was it was an antidepressant, this is the funniest thing, it was an antidepressant prescription that I was, I just thought I needed more, like I just, I just couldn't, I wasn't thinking straight, I just thought, I just, I'm so confused and I'm so sad and I just need more medicine to make me feel better. I just didn't think it was strong enough or something. And, um, so anyway, uh, so I get arrested, which of course is just perfect for him because now everybody's going to believe what he was saying. And um, that case actually gets thrown out. It's, you know, it ends up getting thrown out, but no one knows that. No one knows that. So, you know, I just look like this raging person. And of course, I, and so I have all these decisions to make. So now I'm in a criminal case as well as a, I mean, it doesn't get thrown out that easily. I mean, my, <laughs> my lawyer has to do some work, but um, a, a criminal case and the family court case. And this was the good, one good thing that, about it was that I got to see the contrast between the two. And I definitely felt like the criminal case made a lot more sense. You had to have proof. Yeah, you know, it was all that. The family court case, it didn't matter if there was proof or not. You could just say any old thing, any kind of slandering statement. It, there was no downside to lying. You know, he, it wasn't like there wasn't perjury charges or anything like that. He just could lie and lie and lie. And, um, and then I was always on the defensive, right? So, um, you know, and I, of course, I was playing by the rules 
of society. I was playing by the nice, the nice guy, you know, the amicable divorce rules. You know, like I was thinking, we could just get, to, we could just agree on what to do, and we could just write it all up, and we, you know, amicable. You take, you know, you take the you know, stuff you came in with, and I'll take the stuff I came in with, and then we'll divide everything else up in half, and you know, we'll keep caring for the kids the way that we were, which is primarily my taking care of the kids, and you'll pay me you know, some alimony, and, and that's how, I just told, I totally took it for granted, and, you know, people warn me, they'll, oh, you don't, you know, even a normal guy, I guess, behaves really badly in a divorce, but, um, but, you know, people say, you better start hiding some money, you better start this and that, and that. I go, oh, no, you know, we're, he's a good guy, he's not going to do that to me, I mean, maybe he wants out, but he, you know, for whatever reason, he's going, and I was, kept saying, he's just going through something, it's kind of a, he's, you know, gonna, kind of going through just some midlife crisis or something, and I was sure that he was going to regret it, you know, like, as soon as he, his midlife crisis came and went, but I was still thinking that he was going to come back to the old person that he used to be, not knowing that that was the act, and this is the real person here. There is stuff going on that I could not have imagined in a million years. I mean, it's, it is like a movie. I just cannot believe that, that things are happening. And it, it, it really was like a movie where, you, like, you know, those movie sequences where it's just like, where they start to realize things, they're just like shoveling through things, and then their mind starts going back, and they remember, oh my gosh, that was completely happening. That was completely happening. Now, it was funny, it was interesting too to kind of watch the sequence of how it went, and, and again, talking about the things that I did wrong, oh my God, so did things wrong. The thing to do when you are going to be divorcing a person with a personality disorder that lacks conscience and all that, the thing you have to do is have your ducks in a row, say nothing until you're acting on it. You have to do, you have to have them in the position he had me in. Um, whereas I, which is that you have your plan halfway in it, it happening before you're letting them in on it. Um, you know, you have it all, all figured out before you tell them anything. I did not ever do that because, um, I was just, I was always behind. For all I know, he had the plan figured out 10 years earlier, you know? I certainly think he had, you know, when you think about it, when you think about it, I believe that he had it figured out at least two years earlier when he gave me that birthday party because he wanted, I believe, he wanted to, he wanted a reason to get all of my friends' phone numbers and that he wanted to set a precedent where it wouldn't seem all that weird that he would contact them, where he would have a, real, a friendly relationship with them that was um, out, uh, independent of me where he could contact them directly and it wouldn't seem totally strange. I, I completely, I completely see, saw that years after it happened when I was looking at the video and I was like, oh yeah, now I see. I think that he was thinking about things like that all the time. I mean, when you think about it, how, how was it that he remembered the story that I was telling him the very first time we met I never brought it back up again, and then he thought to tell that story to my parents ten years later. The story about my um, not remembering my childhood, and now I'm having some flashbacks and all that. I hadn't, I hadn't talked to him about about that in in ten years ever, and because um, I stuffed it. And after that, I had other things that were that were constantly uh, coming before it, you know, to push to you know to keep it down. And, um, and, you know, by the time I had a whole life with children and stuff, uh, it, it was not going to come up because I couldn't, you know, at that point I was all about the kids in my life that I was, you know, it wasn't about my childhood at all anymore. So it was, you know, likely never going to come back up. But the fact that he knew, the fact that he saw my family, he saw the dynamic going on in my family immediately when he met us. And he remembered that triggering thing. To, to use 10 years later. I mean, that's spooky to me. That is so super spooky. So, you know, that can only mean to me that he always knew in all the times when I'm thinking that we're gonna be little old, lady, little old men and women out in the, you know, he's gonna look at me and a little old lady with his 
you know, think, oh, she's so, you know, I'm so lucky I had her. That he never thought that day was going to come. He always knew that one day he was going to completely destroy me.